Hey everyone, hopefully you're doing well. Welcome to the Jesus King podcast. How are we doing guys? Sorry, we just had a bit of a laugh. We, we did, <laughs> yes. Um, with the background. Um, our, our tech in the back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was funny. Um, well, we, we've had a good discussion in the last two videos. <clears throat> yeah. Um, we, we spoke about God's design in marriage. We also spoke about how um, creating this biblical healthy atmosphere in mm. your marriage can be not only a blessing for both the couple but it can also have a good impact on the children yeah yeah um, that can be a blessing uh well we're you've kind of hinted where we are going with mm. this episode mm. which is basically healing from those past experiences yeah yeah, yeah. and i I think it's important to kind of go down that route because we're probably in, I believe we're probably in the most sexually saturated culture in human history, I believe. And so most people have a pretty intense sexual background, you know, whether it's, you know, just pornography or anything like mm. that, or they've had multiple sexual partners, which, you know, in history, you look at it, that was very rare. You know, unless you are a prostitute, unless you were someone who did that as a profession, most people, especially women, would be, you know, virgins until they were married. And even men, it was rare for them to have multiple sexual partners. So we're kind of in here. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry, it's it's interesting that you say that because I, I've read a few articles where some porn stars came forward mm. and they're like, um, I'm happy to be a role model to yeah, either younger yeah. men or women. That's right. Yeah. And, and you're like, what occupation do you think <clears throat> you have for, for you to be a to role be a model? Role model yeah. it's, it's not like you're being a scientist trying to find a cure or being a, <laughs> like a doctor or something like that. You, you're using something that is always been known to be filthy, immoral, something that a person would have to degrade themselves yeah. to, um, you know, live that kind of lifestyle or do those kind of jobs. Yeah. Yeah. And yet you come forward and say, I can be a role model yeah. to younger generations because, because that it's you know it's what what the Bible speaks about you know woe to people who call what is good evil and what call what they call evil mm. good you know mm. we look at sexual expression in our culture as something that's good like sexual expression out of the marriage union the marriage covenant it's good it's something freeing you know and you have even in the you know in the psychological field. Um, you have psychologists who are like, you know what, your issue is you're just sexually frustrated. You just need to go and express yourself sexually. <laughs> and they literally teach that. So it's an ideology that destroys because the actual research, so that's a, that's a psychological philosophy, but the actual research is how detrimental it is. And the research and the stats are the more intense uh, or oh, sorry, the higher body counts or the higher um, sexual activity before your marriage, mm -hmm. it correlates to the percentage and the rate of divorce. So you are much more likely to be divorced with the higher sexual activity pre-marriage. Yeah, it, it, it's crazy because <clears throat> I was having this discussion with um, someone in the church and we were we were talking about the you know, the effects of pornography, for example, yeah, it, yeah, not only speaking about sex, but even pornography is you have, for example, teenagers, mm. um, if they are a regular viewer, for example, at the age of 14, 15, yeah. by the time they become an adult 18, they've already seen thousands of naked men and naked women. And people think that pornography is just, oh, it's not, it's not going to have much of an effect and you're oh, like really if you think about it from that perspective that a child mm. who shouldn't be having an access to something like that is viewing thousands of adults mm -hmm. not even his age mm -hmm. adults um doing all these things it does have a it does have a big effect on of their course. on their mind and mm -hmm. even as they like for whether it's young men or women when they look at the opposite sex, um, they they don't see a human being anymore. No, no, they're seeing an object that they that it's it's their object of pleasure, kind yeah, of, you know, of satisfaction, satisfaction. Yeah, sure. And 
they're, they're they're saying now that the the average age of a boy first being introduced to pornography is now at 11 years old mm. so you think about that 11 year old like you would think like in the past before the you know age of information and access to all of these things i mean the majority of men who would first see a naked woman would be you know either on their marriage day or if they were fornicators you know maybe when they were 18 or something mm. like that right but it's just it's really out of control right now and so we have so many distorted views and a distorted view of sex in yeah. our culture and and a lot of people do blame like you know the porn industry mm -hmm. but then <clears throat> you've got your government allowing all these things to happen you've got your schools encouraging these things mm -hmm. right they're teaching educating um young children how to to sleep with someone or even have a safe intercourse mm. um there is no sense of morality so it, it like as long as you love the person yeah now that, yeah they were teaching that you know <laughs> they educate about the practices of sex yeah but there is no education when it comes to what the standard is yeah and what, what sex means like what yeah it was designed for they can't because they don't know the designer so so basically to them sex has no identity no no it's just a physical act it's a physical act, and that's what happens in a naturalistic society so I'll, I'll it's interesting maybe i'll just touch on it quickly but you know when we look at the the greek and roman empires in those kind of cultures sex was a spiritual act for a lot of them so they had like you know their temple prostitutes and they had their orgies and it had a spiritual kind of yeah. um reasoning behind it now that's pagan and that's evil now we're in a naturalistic society and sex is just as prominent if not more prominent but it's not serving you know these statues or these false gods that we've created with our hands it's serving our souls we are our own gods right now yeah and our pleasure is that idol you know it, it is a big thing even outside sex um the idea of loving oneself and elevating that mm. like elevating myself to be priority in my life yeah the satisfaction yeah. of your needs yeah it's it, it's definitely um very tough so for example we we spoke about that there is a lot of effects in mm. that now we coming from a christian perspective and say well if a person comes has a lot of baggage whether it's pornography or whether it's sleeping around having multiple partners or even um experimenting when it comes mm. to sexual experimentation and guys the only reason why we talk about these things is because as a church we shouldn't be shying away from speaking no, about these and things. we do generally like yeah. um a lot of people get awkward around these issues yeah. um and to be honest a pastor shouldn't a pastor or a leader should be like you know what this is fair game this is what we should be mm. in service of yeah. we should be like all right well we need to draw a line as to what's appropriate what's biblical what god um can bless and what he can't bless right um and there's things like christians that would ask questions like oh can we bring another person in and i'm like well that definitely crosses that line mm. you know that's extramarital that's adultery yeah right um there's there are other questions where it's like you know what as long as you know the both of you are consenting and it's for the mutual um, you know love then it's fine you know mm -hmm. so there are these are issues that we should be talking about you know um, experimenting with certain things that's something that with some of it if you're speaking with your partner and you're both in agreement and you're both okay with it then it could be a blessing mm -hmm. you know yeah well in in what you're saying is the idea that we shouldn't be shying away having these conversations because if that person feels like it's awkward to speak to their parents about to the mm. pastor or even their christian brothers and sisters meaning that if i'm going to have this conversation and i really need to have this conversation and the church is not willing to listen mm. then i might speak to someone else That's and right. in speaking to someone else you're not going to expect a biblical advice no, no. you're going to get what the person feels like is the right thing to say yeah. especially if you're like you know women go to their girlfriends or men mm. go to other men 
they're going to get very worldly advice. They're going to get very fleshly advice, you know, because the way the world views sex is self-pleasing, right? It's not really about pleasuring the other person. It's not really about, um, you know, meeting the needs of the other person or, or expressing that oneness with them. It's mm -hmm. about how are you going to receive pleasure and how are you going to receive that satisfaction? So it's a very dangerous thing to look, go to the world and ask them, you know, how, sh how can I better express myself in my sexual life with mm -hmm. my partner, with my spouse? Cool. It's not well, a not a safe thing to do. Since we're talking about it, then um, someone might come with this question. Um, I've had, for example, years of pornography. Of I've, I've had multiple partners. I've became a Christian, mm. yet that pain is still yeah. here. Yeah. Um, I want to receive ho uh, healing. And I want to live a holy life. I want to be the person that God created me to be. Mm. I've been praying about it. I've been reading the Bible, but I don't see myself getting anywhere. Yeah. What, what would your What would your advice be to that person? So, um, this is a very, very deep thing uh, because a lot of people do carry that baggage and they bring it in. We were talking about the gospel earlier. We we're talking about um, the fact that when you come to Christ, He doesn't remember your sin anymore. Mm. He doesn't throw it in your face. He doesn't bring it up. The problem is, in our flesh, we remember things. We remember our past. But once you come to Christ, you're a new creation, right? A new creation created yeah. in Christ Jesus, right? The old is no longer, the new is, right? And so you live this new life. And the idea there is that you don't dredge up the past. You know, when Paul talks to the Corinthians, he says... Um, you know, you know that the sexually immoral will not inherit the kingdom of God. He talks about homosexuals, he talks about fornicators, talks about people that, you know, were in temple prostitution, in orgies, things like that. And he's like, such were some of you. You guys experienced that brokenness. But now, what does he say? You are washed, you are cleaned, you are in Christ. You are a new creation, right? And so what he's saying is no longer remember that. Remember what Christ has done for you and live as though that never happened, mm. right? That is hard. It's not easy. And I would say the greatest um, antidote to it is what we see in Romans 12, where it says, um, do not be conformed to the, the world and the patterns of this world, because conformity to the world is to remember the past, is mm. to remember the things you've experienced. But be transformed by the renewing, renewing of your mind. As you're renewing your mind, as Christ takes dominion over your mind, because he's already taken dominion over your spirit. He's saved your soul. He's saved your spirit. But then he has to renew the mind. Mm. And as you're renewing your mind, you're like, you know what? I no longer look to the things of the past. I no longer bring that mm. into the relationship I'm in now. Or if you're not in a relationship, you want to make sure that you're in Christ before you start one, right? And so there's restoration. There is hope. Like, you're not hopeless. It's not like, oh, I've gone through you know two decades of porn addiction and there's no hope like like i'm destroyed in my brain i'm destroyed in my mind or i've had you know sexual partners you know, it's countless you know, it's hopeless right the gospel is hope to the hopeless you know the Amen. message the message of the gospel is that it doesn't matter how far gone you are and this is what we were talking about um the story of um jose and goma you know that story, which it's a, it's a, it's interpreted to be the story of God and Israel or Jesus and the church, right? But it's also on an individual level because Hosea is called to marry a woman who has a promis has promiscuity, has a promiscuous past, you know, verging on prostitution. Mm. He marries her and she continues to prostitute him herself, and she goes and she's indebted because of her extravagant wealth and she wants the things of the world. And she ends up selling herself into slavery to pay off her debts. And then God sell, says to her, Hosea, go back and pay for her and bring her back home. Even the children he has are not his own. Mm. You know, they're from her other, other lovers. And you see the brokenness of this woman. And you see Hosea coming up to her and being like, I'm going to buy you. I'm pursuing you. I'm going to redeem you. You're going to be mine again. Right? And he's there to heal her and to to um, take care of her and to protect her and to provide her needs. And that's the story of Christ and the church. 
but also let's say on a micro level if you have a spouse who also has a background or has brokenness in the past in in that sense you are supposed to act in that manner as well that you're to pursue and to provide for her needs and to be as um accommodating spiritually speaking to what she's experienced in the past or what he's experienced in the past as well mm -hmm. so one of the ways that i believe that god can restore certain people is you know if they're both believers is that putting a believing spouse in your life can be a very a very big encouragement mm -hmm. you know um and there's a there's a restoration and there's a redemption in that as well you know when people do get married that god begins to redefine and and redefine how they view sex how they view marriage how they view relationships because before sex was something self-seeking and now it's something where it's like i'm fulfilling the needs of another person mm. right and so the expectation changes and that's one of the very detrimental things about pornography is because it sets an unrealistic expectation it's not realistic it's not something that really happens in real life mm. um and you've got you know the whole variety thing you know you're going from video to video to video to video yeah and you're not you know you're not intimate with the object you're looking at right yeah yeah and so when you come to christ and he's starting to recreate in you the image of god right he's 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 you're you're being remade into the image of christ and conformed to his image it won't be overnight most of the time but he will get you there he will yeah. restore you it's it's part of sanctification yeah. and and what's so important is that um sometimes people are worried about um can my past creep into my marriage it can at mm. times but then if you are in christ you're starting a new covenant with that person mm. and that covenant is um built on you being faithful to them in your heart with your mind as well as with your flesh and yeah. and jesus teaches about both of them is to be faithful in your heart because if you are lusting in your heart jesus likens it same to adultery exactly right? yeah if yeah. you view a woman with lust, it's same as adultery so you you are coming into a new relationship the only difference in this relationship is that it has been blessed by god mm. it's been honored by both of you and is being built on love and faithfulness it's not like your previous relationship where you come and think she's pretty or he's pretty and yeah. i'm going to be satisfied um with their body with whatever they're going to provide me with their services and yes we're going to go out date like everybody else but the ultimate goal is for me to sleep with that person mm. it's no longer that in your marriage yeah. especially in your christian marriage you're coming under christ you're making that covenant you're becoming a flesh with that person not by the act of sex alone but by being together like we're, we've spoken about this in the first two videos is that um what's his name adam he says that i'm going to become one flesh with her he's not speaking about an act of sex no that is his covenant with his wife so being one with your husband or your wife it's not the act of sex alone but it's actually your marriage day to day every mm -hmm. moment of it whether you are serving each other loving each other watching a movie together whatever the um the whatever you're doing together it's it's all about being one with each mm -hmm. other and cherish that yeah. cherish that the closer you are with each other um and the more you have of god the less need mm -hmm. that you have for someone else yeah because yeah. that spot in your life is always being filled by god and by your spouse exactly. Exactly. it's so important a lot of people they start looking elsewhere is because they neglect their relationship with god first and foremost and they neglect their relationship with their spouse and when they find that something that was previously filled before now is no longer full it's empty mm -hmm. they want to fill it but instead of going back to god and their spouse they go and try and seek something else yeah because in their mindset they have this illusion that um oh, my god is not enough my spouse is not enough but then don't re 
realize that it's not about them not being enough yeah it's you not being full with them you know anymore yeah, yeah. so i think that's something very important for us to be discerning yeah and and recognize why are we why we might be looking outside of our marriage yeah outside yeah. our relationship because there, there's biblical instruction and there's biblical commands to you know um find joy in the wife of your youth to to find joy in your spouse in them alone like you know when we're talking sexually don't find joy anywhere else you know even um job talks about um, making a covenant with his eyes not to look upon another virgin or another woman um because he finds joy in what god has given him and contentment in that and it's because you realize you're one with that person for the rest of your life and there <clears throat> there's a comfort in that knowing that you know what this is all i will ever need mm -hmm. right um and so that that's god's design and we we talked about in the first one um but one of the issues as well is like we're looking at spouses who they kind of weaponize the the sexual past of you know their spouse mm -hmm. and they use that against them and that's a very unbiblical thing to do as well like we were talking about god forgiving and not remembering your sin anymore but sometimes your spouse does mm -hmm. and they start to look at what you've done in the past and they'll be like oh this is the reason that we're not good this is the reason things are happening this you know and so if you're a believer that's something you should never do you should never be like oh you know what the things that happened in your past we're suffering for it now mm. you know and people have that mentality uh, there's there's people as well like in very hyper charismatic circles you know where they they kind of they're being taught by their pastor that there's like you know curses of the past that are coming into the the relationship and you're like well hold on you're a new creation in christ mm. you know that's all done it's all over you're dredging something up you're bringing something in that god already sorted out and handled yeah. you know on the cross and so it's kind of like we have to read disciple people and really teach them and remodel for them what it means to be a married couple and what it means to be free in your sexual experience and in your sexual life with one another you know um there should be a freedom you're not going to put restrictions on them and you're not going to weaponize your sexual life either you know i was talking to you earlier about this this um this counselor this uh, christian marriage counselor who was saying he was kind of teaching women um to use sex as a way to coerce their husbands or um, persuade them to do certain things for them like you know um, to help out around the house well if he doesn't help around the house then maybe you don't give him what he wants at mm. you know in the bedroom yeah that's evil mm. you know that's something that god kind of prohibits it's like no that's not the way you go about doing things don't withhold from one another be generous be loving fulfill the needs right and if there's issues just communicate it yeah you in know? first corinthians 7 which we read yeah. earlier is that your body doesn't belong to you no, no. um and your spouse's body doesn't belong to her and, and this is the beauty of it that it's not my body my choice mm. it's we are one together we are one flesh and we can work this out in in people having that mindset that um i would provide the service of sex if my partner does this this mm. this that they don't recognize that they are prostitute, prostituting yeah, themselves. Yeah, it's a form right? of prostitution. Right? It is. So basically prostitution, it could be you're providing that service of sex, either it's for money or if it's for gifts or if it's for someone else. And in today's culture, it's, you know, for example, if your man or your woman doesn't bring gifts or flowers or chocolates or this or it's not romantic enough, mm. that means you, you shouldn't, you know be romantic with them and then you think that's not a biblical advice no no and that's not going to get you anywhere in your marriage because what you're doing here is you're basically buying and selling and your body is the product of it mm -hmm. and and our body is never for sale even for our own partners no. it's something that we're willing to share with our partner we have to be because yeah. it's it's kind of that christian principle that <clears throat> when you're one all right and each of you is viewing the other spouse as the owner of your body then 
you've lost that authority of like, oh, I have this independence in my own body to do whatever I want. You're like, no, that's not the way it works anymore. Um, there's a principle and there's a spiritual law here where it's like, give to your wife what belongs to her and your wife gives to you what belongs to you, you know? Mm. So it's a, it's a very interesting thing when you're, when you're looking at the way the world views sexual relationship and the way the Bible views it. And even the way the world views, so we talked we talked about the red pill men, the way the world views women with a sexual past versus the way that they view a man with a sexual past. Mm. For a man, it's kind of normal. For a woman, it's it's like, you know, the word ratchet. It's disgusting. She's a tramp, right? Mm. If she has a high body count, she's disposed of. She's yeah. drained, used, and she's worth nothing. But if a man's done it, hey, you know. He's doing well for He's himself. doing well. He's conquered. Yeah. Um, that's not the way that the scriptures speak of it because both are on the same level of playing field, mm -hmm. right? Both men and women are broken, right? And the hope of the gospel is they can both be restored. But we shouldn't have this idea that one is less than the other because one's a woman and the other's a man. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And so when I view a man and he's had multiple sexual partners or had you know a history of sexual perversion and activity in their life they're broken mm -hmm. they are a person who needs christ who needs to be restored and the message of the gospel is you can be cool come to god yeah. come to christ that's a great point that we've spoken about i want to share th this and i want to get your opinion on it is that um you do have a lot of people that do encourage that sex is not an important part of your marriage Mm. And it's not something that should be a focus, you know, if it's not there, it's not there, move on. Mm -hmm. um, what would your perspective be? Do you think a healthy marriage requires a healthy sexual practices and life? Or do you think you could have a marriage without a sex life? Could you have a marriage without a sex life? It's possible, like, you know, there's people who are paraplegics and mm. stuff and they can't that's the that, exception of the rule yeah right so so that, no average. but you know you know there's people who will be like oh well what about this yeah so yes but in general no cool in cool. general the biblical design is to be pleased with with one another sexually and to come together sexually and if there's an issue you've got to communicate that and you've got to sort that out get to the yeah. source of it because and you know there's a there's a lot of factors that can play into it. You know, sometimes you know, for for a lot of women, they're tired, they're overstimulated, mm -hmm. they've had a big day with the kids, and they have headaches. And and for men, it's kind of the you know, just come on, let's go. You know, like let's let's do this. So and sometimes it's the other way around. Some men are less in the libido, and the women are more desiring. So you well, know. last time I checked, actually. I think it's 70, 30%. Yeah. So yeah. it's not like it's overwhelming no, for men. No, no. I'm not sure how accurate it is, but that's, yeah. that's so, what I So seen. there are some couples yeah. where it's the man who has a less of a drive and the woman really desires yeah. it. But in both cases, there has to be a, a mutual understanding between the both that, you know what, having compassion on the other person. All right, well, you know, we've done it four times this week. Let's you know, give her a break, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. Um, but in general, there should be a healthy sex life. There should be um, a healthy view of what sex is that you're coming together. And, you know, of course, you're going to have, you know, days and weeks maybe where you're out of sync or whatnot. But in general, you should because mm -hmm. that does bring you closer together. You know, we, we look at the term sexual intercourse, literally means sexual communication because you're communicating to the other person your love for them, um, that, you know, you are one with them, that they're safe with you, you're, you know, you're secure with me. Yeah. There's all these things that you're communicating in that act Yeah. that it gets distorted when you are having sex premaritally and you're having multiple partners and, or, you know, even if you're, doing it yourself you know yeah so, so conclusion basically if if you are obviously working and pay, paying attention to um the spiritual aspect of marriage psychological and emotional aspect of marriage you also need to pay attention to 
um, the sexual of side course, of marriage. Of course, yeah. And and that's important. Um, don't undermine it. It's it's something that's um, it, and it can it 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 is interesting because sometimes we think sex is about sexual satisfaction. Mm. But we don't understand that how it can pour out into other areas of, of your marriage. And this, it, it yeah. can be much, you know, it, it can be more of a blessing in other places yeah. in, in your the, marriage. The pleasure is one part of it. And it's an important part. Yeah. But it's it's that closeness that coming. I mean, you're, you're bonding yourself. You're binding yourself to the person, you know, in this act. And there are spiritual repercussions to that. And this is why people feel so broken when they've had so many sexual partners is because they don't realize the spiritual effect of that. You yeah. know, when Paul's talking to the people and saying, don't you know, when you're having sex with a prostitute, you're becoming one with her. There's this spiritual element to it that the world doesn't want to think about because of the naturalistic society and ideology we have. Mm. Cool. But there's brokenness with the major with, a huge amount of premarital fornication, homosexual, all of that kind of act. Mm. There's a brokenness there, but there's restoration. And the hope is in the gospel. And I just wanted to read, you know, this is the the um the key element of what happens in in the gospel in Second Corinthians five, verse um seventeen. Where says therefore anyone in christ is a new creation the old has passed away behold the new has come all this is from god who through christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that is in christ god was reconciling the world to himself not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation that's your hope the hope is no matter where what you've done in the past you come to Christ, you are new, you are brand new. It doesn't, it doesn't count. It's not going to, it's not going to dictate what you've done in the past. It won't dictate your future and it won't dictate your journey with God or with your marriage or with your spouse. Cool. Well, we're coming to the end of it. Um, do you want to say a few last words? I think we're, we're good. You yeah. Know, yeah. Great. So Please, if you've enjoyed that, you found it um, edifying in your relationship, in your marriage, um, and I hopefully, hopefully you've been encouraged through this. Uh, please do not take these topics very lightly. Um, the reason why there is a lot of divorce out there is because people are not paying attention to these um, important signs. In, in their marriages, right? Mm. And then by the time they actually start to focus on them, at times it is a bit too late mm. where the other person is so hurt with that relationship you know that they no longer have you know any intention of working through this yeah so i just do encourage you please um it, and i heard this i, I really like uh, um one of the i think it was a pastor or psychologist or something like that he says often i a lot of times I get people come to me when their marriage is falling apart, but mm. no one comes when their marriage is flourishing. Yeah. Yeah. But we do take it for granted. We think just because our marriage is doing well, that I will wait for the tough times. Mm. Then I'll deal with my marriage every single day, every single week, improve on your marriage, whether things are going well yeah. or not. Yeah. Yeah. Don't think ju just because you feel like, um, at the moment, it feels safe, it feels comfortable, things are go going well, that it's going to continue this way. Yeah. No, it doesn't It doesn't work this There's way. There's always room for improvement. <clears throat> There's always room to grow, to edify, to, yeah. to be more like Christ in your marriage. Yeah. Great. God bless you all. Hopefully you've enjoyed it. We'll see you next time. Next time I'll have a meal with me. So we're going to be doing, um, doing some work with Emil. Awesome. So God bless you all. We'll see you next time. Take care.